and welcome to another episode of Mid-Era Meets, the monthly music podcast where we talk to a wide range of people from the music industry. This month I'm speaking to Phil Nelson, who's had an esteemed career in management, managing over 13 bands, including The Levelers, Long Pigs, Aqualung, Duke Special and Sweet Billy Pilgrim. Phil was instrumental in the startup of the Great Escape Festival in Brighton, which hosts 500 artists playing across the city and is one of Europe's biggest inner city festivals. Phil's also worked on profiling the music scene within Brighton in order to create a sustainable ecosystem of music which has gone tremendously well and is now being adapted for cities all over the world. I got up with Phil earlier on this year to chat about his career, and this is what happened. All right, Phil, thank you very much uh, for talking to me this afternoon. Pleasure. Uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Um, your your CV is, is, is an epic thing. Of <laughs> many years of, of dedication to the industry. I've decided that uh, because I live in Compton Road, if I ever write... An autobiography, it has to be called Straight Out of Compton Road. Yeah, definitely. Oh, Straight Out of Compton Road, yeah, very good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's just move that. Bit. Good, so yeah, the, the first question I normally ask on my podcast is mm. um, about your musical beginnings and okay. your, your early memories of music growing up. Well, I um, didn't necessarily come from a particularly musical family, but certainly I think from before I could... Um, read, I know that I knew all of the um, inner labels of my father's record collection by their colours and their shapes and we had reel to reel quarter inch tapes as well that um, I would get to know um, everything that was possibly there um, so it was obviously ingrained in me from from the word go um, and in fact amusingly and somebody reminded me of this recently I think when I was six I would give all the girls in my primary school class recorder lessons at lunchtime and, <laughs> and their, their mums would phone my mum to ask what sort of recorders they should buy their daughters, which um, unfortunately I think that, that my ability of chatting up girls probably um, peaked at that time. So <laughs> but it's learning the piano um, um, and um, amassing a sort of a classical record collection. I think then and now I, I have a, a bit of a concern that music that's in schools has a sort of a classical bent to it um, mm -hmm. po probably mainly because the sort of people who choose to be music teachers come from a classical music background again I remembered recently that um, I got sent to live with my headmaster's family when my, my parents moved to Iran and um, my headmaster had a, a son a bit older than me who introduced me to Queen and I one of the first records I bought in 1975 was A Night at the Opera, which is a fantastic record. Um, and when, as you sometimes do at school, you get the thing where on the last week of term you can bring your records in, I proudly brought in A Night at the Opera. And most of my um, school friends brought in sort of musicals and classical music, and uh, my music teacher didn't know this record and said, what song should I play? And of course I loved the whole record and didn't really think about this as a young child, and said, mm -hmm. play anything. So he played the first song, which is of course Death on Two Legs, which includes the great lyric, and then you can kiss my ass goodbye. She didn't go down too well in class <laughs> when you're 10 years old. Um, and um, you know, I was roundly told that this wasn't really music, and, um, and, and yeah, obviously pop music was out. And I think some of these sort of <clears throat> tensions and, and differences of different sorts of music, and indeed the ability to see over the fence from... The different sorts of classical music, from you know, the the sort of romantic to the atonal, through to the different types of commercial music, um, is something that I've um, continued to 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 love all sorts of music as I've grown up. Yeah, um, you can see there's there's, a, there's this quite a wide variety of, of musical things you've been involved in. Mm. Um, it's interesting that you say that lyric because the back of my T-shirt is a Ben Folds Five lyric. Ah, yes. Which uh, maybe <laughs> is an ode to <laughs> well, it might be Queen. I wonder. I'd never, I'd never heard uh, that lyric before. Okay, it well, be. well, it's funny. Um, <clears throat> Matt Hales, who I manage, who is a sort of piano playing singer songwriter, is in some ways the English Ben Folds, and so oh, really? um, <clears throat> they they definitely get likened to one another from I time see. to time. Matt Hayes. 
Good. And then, so you picked up um, a couple of instruments uh, when you were younger, is that correct? You had piano... Yeah, no, and then bassoon, of all things, because I went to boarding school, and um, when I got to boarding school, and it had a very, um, an excellent orchestra, and I loved the idea of getting into an orchestra, but, um, and so I, 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 I think I'm quite proud of myself, I did a bit of research to find what was the instrument that you'd get into the orchestra fastest by playing, <laughs> because obviously in the violin, playing the violin, you'd be in a queue, and you'd never get into the orchestra unless you were any good, uh, but nobody else played the bassoon, and so I persuaded my parents to shell out, I think, 400 quid for a second-hand bassoon, so God knows what they cost now. <laughs> and, yeah, within a year, I was playing bassoon in the school orchestra. Uh, it's a ridiculous instrument. For those people who don't know it, uh, the, either the engine theme tune is the bassoon. Right. Um, and um, there is a great band with a lead bassoonist called Griffin, who um, are a 70s band, but they've just come back, and I think their average age of their musicians must be about 72, but uh, <laughs> they're fantastic. Um, and so, yes, I, I played the bassoon in, in the school orchestra, in the Bournemouth Youth Orchestra, in Southampton University Orchestra. But I think I realised that where you see that some people, when they pick up an instrument, just have that natural aptitude, the sort of the nature versus nurture thing. For me, it was sort of 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration, whether it be as a bassoonist or indeed singing in a band. Um, I realised that perhaps my role lay behind the scenes as opposed to as a performer um, much as I um, enjoyed it and still have a piano and, and still t and tinker but, but um, it was never going to be my my way forward yeah but it's incredible that you say that you you weren't really sort of talented in doing it but yet you still got to a very high level in the piano and the bassoon really <laughs> Well, um, I, yeah, again, I think because I cared and I practised a lot as opposed to one of those people like my cousin used to really annoy me because he could pick up any instrument and within about a week he was better at it than me. <laughs> and uh, again, it, it's, that's not fair. But um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I sort of laugh at the fact that I've got a grade eight distinction uh, <laughs> on the bassoon. But also, I remember when I um, um, went to my uh, bassoon teacher who was the principal at the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, we both had a knowing look at each other, and I think what we what the look meant, although we never translated it into words, was, you're not really that good, Phil. You've been kind of a bit lucky to get that, that mark. I'm not <laughs> going to tell you that you don't deserve it, because I wasn't there at your exam, but you're not a talented bassoonist. You're never, not going to play in the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, but well done anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All in one look. That's All amazing. in one look. That, well, that's how I remember it anyway. <laughs> that's incredible. Um... Yeah, so I was trying to think of a famous bassoonist, and the only thing, the only uh, person that came to mind was Gerard Hofnung, but I, I researched it, and I think his instrument was the, the tuba. Yes, I think you're right, or the tuba or the French horn or something. Um, yeah, famous bassoonist. Well, obviously, um, I guess if you are a an orchestral concerto aficionado, there are a few, but um, I think in in, in terms of um, a Mick Khan from Japan, the band Japan, who I'm a massive fan of, mm -hmm. he was a bassoonist. He played in the London School Symphony Orchestra, and he tells the story, although he's dead now, that um, on the way home from school in Catford, he was uh, beaten up and had his bassoon stolen and never got another one. But if wow. you listen to any of um, his solo work or any of his, his music, he plays the bassoon on some of his songs, and so... Um, he will be my token famous bassoonist, Mick Khan, bass player of Japan. Of Japan, yeah. Japan's a band that my, my best friend in Eastbourne raves about. Very well. It's David Sylvian's That's the lead correct. singer, yeah. Yeah. I he love them. Yeah, yeah. Obsessed with them when he was younger. Yeah. Good. And so um, you sort of you started uh, during your education to move into music industry themed things. Um, you were doing an English degree, is that right? I did a, a combined BA um, at Southampton called English and Music with right. Half and Half. Um, and it was it was remarkably progressive for the time because I can remember that I you could do what was called an electronic project for a tenth of your degree and I handed in my band's demo tapes. You could write <laughs> uh, for a bridge project between English and music, you could write a play and do the music for it. So um, I sort of did manage to kind of tailor my degree to the things that interested me. Um, then... At that point, I had no idea what I wanted to do career-wise. but um, And so I did the thing that, that often I think people certainly did, maybe more then than now. I just thought I'll carry on being a student for a while. So I uh, mm -hmm. applied to do an English MA and got in at Sussex. And after about a month or two of doing an English MA, I realised that 
I wasn't enjoying it. It was it was getting so far away from sort of novels and 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 fiction <clears throat> towards sort of recent French psychoanalysis and other slightly um, turgid stuff. <laughs> so I thought maybe I'd prefer to do a music MA. And I went to my supervisor and asked if I was allowed to. <clears throat> and he said, well, the way that it works is you go to the music department and you find somebody to be your supervisor. Um, and he asked me what I wanted to do my dissertation on. And I'm not sure where this came from because there was very little of it around at the time. This was in 1987. Um, I said that I wanted to do it on how the music industry affects the type of music we all end up listening to, mm -hmm. um, which re became remarkably prescient about 20 years later in terms of what I, I ended up doing. So, of course, in those days, and possibly even now, Sussex University was a very um, classically-minded institution, and all of the people who worked there said, well, that sounds really interesting. I know nothing about that. I will not be your supervisor. So once I'd exhausted all of the opportunities, I went back to the English guy and said, nobody wants to be my, or nobody has the background to be my supervisor. And he said something which I'm very thankful of. He said, well, you seem to know what it is you want to do. You can do it without a supervisor. Um, wow. And I went and did find found the, the few books and articles that were relevant to the subject, got a decent MA, um, put it to one side and you know, became a rock and roll band manager for 20 years and then went back to academia and, and sort of carried on in many ways where I left off. That's brilliant. I mean, they must have seen something within you that, that to give you the responsibility to say you can supervise yourself on this one. Like that's, I think that there aren't many students you'd look at and say <laughs> that supervise your own <laughs> masters on this. I, one. Yeah, okay. I, I, yeah, I suppose, like so many things, actually in, in the in the career that I embarked upon, I had nothing to compare it with, so I didn't know, and I still, I suppose, in some ways, don't know. Although, as you say, can't imagine saying that to that many of my students, um, a couple, admittedly. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, but I'm very grateful. That's incredible. That's incredible. And so, yeah, you, you went on to really absorb yourself in the music industry um, in a number of ways, in, in a huge number of ways. So you started a label called Hag. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, I I, I, I had sang, sung in a... In a ridiculously pretentious new romantic band that we call Kafka Hag and I can't even remember really why it was called Kafka Hag <laughs> but that's where the Hag in Hag Records came from and I yeah this was while I was doing my MA um, I think that I was beginning to realize that I was surrounded by lots of talented bands and musicians and it felt probably then and in a different way now that that there were more people wanting to make music than people interested in helping to promote it which is again maybe understandable mm -hmm. and so I thought why didn't I start a record label in order to help my talented friends music get discovered um, hugely naively that thing of, 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 of how do you get a record pressed um, do some research find out how much it costs press a few singles press a compilation album of um, bands from Brighton Portsmouth and what was it, Southampton, Brighton, Bournemouth, something like that, um, and um, started to sort of get an understanding of, of what the local circuit looked like, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, seeing some of the bands, that were the really good bands that I felt that were coming out of, uh, of there, and I think it was interesting that um, one of the Brighton bands was a band called The Fence, the, the singer was my cousin Jason, but the bass player and drummer were the rhythm section that became the rhythm section of the Levelers. So there were various people on that record that, that ended up playing for much more successful artists. How did you? I mean, how did you go about promoting your label in the beginning? Did you have? Did you have like a vision of where you wanted to take it? Mm -hmm. um, no, I don't think I did. I don't think I was that sussed or smart. I think that I obviously did some asking around, and I think for, I've discovered in those days there was a thing called the cartel, and the cartel was a network of independent record distributors, and it had grown out of rough trade who um, had started a few years earlier, um, first and foremost as a distributor in a shop and became a label a little later. Mm -hmm. And the cartel had regional centres. It didn't have one 
I don't think, in the south of England. It had one in London, obviously, which was rough trade. But a friend of mine who had a label in Portsmouth called Bite Back, who still actually promotes at the Wedgwood Rooms in Portsmouth, his name's Ian Binnington, and he had a label called Bite Back, and they were distributed through Bax, which was the Norwich-based um, uh, representative of the cartel. So I got in touch with Derek Chapman, who ran Bax, and said, I've got a label, will you distribute it? And I think, looking back, that in some ways he was sort of charmed by my naive optimism as opposed to my um, nous and said that he would and so he was responsible for trying to get my records into the shops and obviously until the levellers came along um, nobody was particularly well known and so not very many records ever got stocked but it taught me what distribution was which was great and I put on sort of nights of, of local bands in, in along the south coast um, there was a, a band called the Crop Dusters who were sort of a little bit folk punk like the levellers who had a bit of a fan base uh, it was an amazing band who, um, who was sort of the proto Smiths called the Regular Guys, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, again, I think it was that thing of, of learning by doing, and there wasn't nearly as much competition in those days because I suppose it was hard to work out what to do, um, and that's I suppose sort of how I started to learn a little bit about how the music industry worked, and <clears throat> ended up managing the uh, emerging levellers. Yeah, well it's great that you had that vision that you saw the talent within this group of people and you wanted to take it, you wanted to take their, their music um, further. Yeah, so how was it um, working, uh, managing the levelers? Because um, I believe you were a friend of theirs who sort of liked their music and became a manager of them. Pretty, right? Yeah, I suppose pretty much in as much as I say, I'd, I'd known Charlie the drummer and Jeremy the bass player because they were in my cousin's band. Um, I shared a flat... Um, across the valley from where we are now in Brighton um, with the drummer Charlie. Um, he would for, go off to rehearsals with this band, The Levellers. Because they were sort of rock music with a violin, <clears throat> I didn't think I'd like them very much and didn't think it was going to be my sort of thing. I liked pretentious, complicated music like Japan. Um, <laughs> and this was sort of the Clash meets the Waterboys. Oh, I love the Water Boys. So I remember when it came to their first gig, I was actually driving to Southampton to see another band relating to my label and didn't even go to my flatmate's first gig but I, was, I can remember sort of lying in bed the following morning and hearing a bit of a commotion downstairs and it was quite obvious that the gig had gone very well and then I realised I hadn't even listened to his demo cassette that he'd made that he'd given me and, and I got this feeling of guilt and I stretched over to the cassette player and, and bunged it on in my bedroom and it was amazing. Um, a number of the songs on the demo ended up on their debut album and uh, I just thought hold on a minute this has such energy and such passion and uh, Mark's such a great singer um, I really would be mad not to get involved and I just basically said to them can I be your manager you need someone to organize you, you and, and and you know I was somebody with enthusiasm and, and passion as opposed to a plan or, 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 or much knowledge but um, but they said yes and I think that the first thing I realised was that I had to make sure that I learnt faster than they did. I think when young, enthusiastic managers don't, and they get left behind and they get fired, um, mm -hmm. and the levellers became quite popular quite quickly, and so I had uh, quite a lot to learn quite fast. I um, was working in London, commuting to London, working for a modern classical music arts council funded charity called the Society for the Promotion of New Music which was great fun and, and in fact I joke about the fact that because I used their phone and franking machine and photocopier that the Arts Council was in fact in some ways funding the levellers oh, yeah. without knowing it um, and so yeah I was, <laughs> I was using my lunch hours and the evenings and so on just to, tr to try and understand what the music industry was and, and where the levellers might fit and what they needed to do as, as best I could um, and, and, and uh, off became a journey my first kind of um, point of contact ended up being a booking agent who had recently left HMV as a buyer uh, to work for a, a, a booking agency where they said to him well as long as you find some bands you've got a job and his first band came the levelers and his name is Charlie Myatt he's still my best friend I saw him last night mm -hmm. he is now booking agent for Radiohead the Arctic Monkeys the Stone Roses Royal Blood 
and he's a millionaire. Wow. I'm not. That, that's a good <laughs> but, <laughs> um, he's that done, So he's done even much, much better than I have. The Royal Blood are from Brighton, isn't they it? Are, yeah, they, they, right. I think someone told me they, they rehearse at Brighton Electric. That's right, Because we, we have rehearsed there a couple of times. And, and so do The Cure, by the way, rehearse at Brighton yeah. Electric. So yeah, uh, lots of um, people do. So yes, it was... Um, and do you, think that the, do you think that the fundamentals of band management have changed from those days to, to where we are now? Do you yes, think, yeah? they absolutely have. And I think that the somebody else put it a lot better than I did. Somebody said that uh, in the 80s or maybe even the 90s, if you wanted to become a band manager, there are probably about 50 things you need to learn how to do. Now there are 5,000 things you need to learn how to do because mm -hmm. uh, of the digitization and everything, the, the different the types of income streams. There are probably 100 times more income streams than there used to be. It's really, really complicated, which is sort of why I get I, I, I'm very um, um, defensive protective I don't know what the right word is of the music business degree that I teach because for anyone who sort of says why, why on earth should that be a degree the answer is because it's really complicated yeah. <laughs> and very and very fast changing um, you, you, can, you can become outdated very quickly if you're not careful yeah because I think um, the way that things are now there are a lot of bands self-managing and um, I wonder whether you think that's a good road to go down in the early days for bands. Do yes, think absolutely. I mean, I think that the, the bottom line is that there there are not and there never will be as many good managers as there are good artists or bands. And so there's not enough to go around. Therefore, bands have to learn how to look after themselves. And uh, I will often say to, to people who are interested in studying, um, come and do the music business degree. You're already a good singer. You don't need to do a singing degree. Um, learn how to do it you know Mick Jagger has always had a manager but he's famously one of the most the smartest musicians out there who knows the difference between tax laws in France and Switzerland perhaps mm -hmm. that's because uh, that's more because he's so wealthy I don't know but um yeah, yeah so self-management is often a, um, a need rather than a desire and it's often a stepping stone um but understanding how to build your brand however dull and unrock and roll that sounds is really really important yeah, and I think um, yeah, bands nowadays are really looking to sort of spread how they're making money. Even an artist like Gary Newman, for example, um, he does meet and greets with his audiences. Mm -hmm. He, uh, you can buy tickets to watch this band practice. Mm -hmm. You can buy his old gear that he's finished using with. Obviously, it's all merch and things like that. So there are lots of revenue streams I think that have occurred recently that yeah. have just never existed in the past. Absolutely, and I think you know, crowdfunding is a great example of, of um, ways in which you can think about what a, 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 gen, a super fan might want, and it's both things and it's experiences, but and they're going to be very different for genre to genre and artist to artist. But yes, I think um, it's not as simple as as the, 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 the slab of vinyl and the concert ticket, which it once was. Because mm -hmm. you did raise um, five fifty thousand pounds with. For Duke Special, is that correct? I did, yeah. I've done music? four different um, crowdfunding campaigns now for oh, Duke Special and Sweet Billy Pilgrim um, because I think in certain instances it's the right way of raising money. Some, sometimes it's the only way of raising money. And it, um, it's also a way of retaining your own rights if you don't want to give them to a record company, which I don't think is a right or wrong way, but there are so many choices now. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you approach those things? How do you find out what the audience want? And, and how how things are going to engage them and excite them? It's a very good question. I think that um, the direct artist to fan relationship is really important, and I still think it's probably one of the last bastions of an area of the music industry that that is little understood because labels and busy managers um, don't have the time to finesse it in the best possible way. Um, I pride myself in probably being the first manager who, who was interested in, in, in the direct artist to fan relationship in as much as with the levelers we built a snail mail, i.e. before the, the internet mailing list of about 70,000 levelers fans home addresses. Um, I said to the promoter Simon Moran when he was about to print the concert tickets for a tour can you put a space for people to put their name and address on the ticket stub that goes back to the promoter 
and he agreed and he gave me all the ticket stubs and of the 70,000 about 40,000 of them had names and addresses on them so it was of course me that had to type them into <laughs> database night after night which took ages but it then suddenly meant we could circumnavigate the press or the record company or anybody else in order to communicate with our fans um, and we did a lot of that we started a fan club we had a 24 hour information phone line and um, I would argue that it's one of the reasons why the Levelers have such a loyal fan base to this day um, obviously it all changed with the advent of the internet and I think what's more important nowadays is that the relationship needs to be two way it needs to be an ongoing conversation with your fan base which is obviously going to be a very different conversation if you have two million Facebook likes and you're Bastille than if you have 50 Facebook likes and you're an emerging artist mm -hmm. but the principles are the same and I think that through that conversation you start to get a feeling for what they want and indeed what your artist is willing to do. Um, I can remember you know, Duke Special, for example, and Sweet Lily Pilgrim are brilliant at house concerts. And if you're the pe sort of people who can go into strangers' houses, and if you're the sort of music that you can play in strangers' living rooms, it's a fantastically good way of earning money. Um, we did an amusing thing where, we, for, for, as part of crowdfunding, we said, Duke Special will and his manager will come round your house for dinner and we'll bring the dessert and um, you know, some people would hate that uh, but, but it was sort of fun I think we did one particular house concert to uh, 45 Jehovah's Witnesses which was unexpected so you have to kind of expect the unexpected um, in crowdfunding that really is like bringing the band to the to the audience isn't it yeah like accessibility to artists is very different now isn't it because even like artists themselves have a direct channel of communication. I remember even on Twitter, I sent a tweet to Johnny Greenwood one time, and he oh, actually yeah. replied to me. Great, yeah. yeah. And it was it was a very magical <laughs> moment that that accessibility that they have. It's complicated because I think you know that there are certain people who get into music because they want to be mean and moody and dress in black and be put on a pedestal and be impossible to to, to communicate with and and get very exercised by this new world where you're supposed to be sort of naked and and, um, and and your fans can say what they like and do what they like and, and all that sort of thing mm. um, so it is it is it's complicated but but you have to find there's no one size fits all rules it's it's very very different from artist to artist I think yeah then you're taking away your own valuable time away from making music to support the absolutely and I think that's the that's people. the danger I think that that um, and I've seen it I think I have seen it actually probably interfere with, with, with creative people's art when they're, they're too busy answering every message or whatever it might be. So it's, it's definitely a balance and it's going to change year in, year out as, as uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence and everything else change, changes everything. So who knows what's around the corner? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> As a manager, you've you've had a very pretty esteemed career, uh, working with the Levelers, the Long Pigs, and you currently now um, you work with Aqualung, Duke Special, and Sweet Billy Pilgrim. That's right. That's on your first column management company. That you yeah, well, I think I changed its name from Hag, which is what it started out as, and um, the the name came to me quite a long time ago it must have been probably in the uh, mid 90s where I kind of thought it, if I called my management company Nelson's Column uh, picking up the phone saying hello Nelson's Column would stop being funny <laughs> after about three calls so I kept the column and called it First Column and um, that's that's remained as, as the name of the management company oh that's cool um, but yes I mean I think um, in, in the in the 90s it was the levellers the Long Pigs, a band called Octopus, who was signed to Food. Um, a really young girl, I was listening to her songs in the gym this morning, uh, who was only 14 when I started managing her, but she was an astonishing singer-songwriter called Victoria, who got a deal with London Records. Um, and I look back on the 90s and I, I, I kind of can't believe what happened, because actually the Levelers and Long Pigs in particular, I would say, were quite difficult to manage. They, they were very forceful, larger-than-life personalities. 
they didn't always like each other. There was quite a lot of drinking drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, there were quite a lot of situations which I had to rescue people from in terms of arrests and God knows what else. It was fighting fires all the time. And because I didn't know any different, I suppose I just got on with it. But I, I, I also can remember it being quite a lonely um, job because when you're especially dealing with bands, they don't all necessarily agree with each other. And you've got the label on one side with its own agenda and the band's agenda. And if you're trying to basically marry the two, what often ends up happening is that they both hate you because mm -hmm. you're, you're actually not agreeing with the band and you're not agreeing with the label. And so it's very lonely and, and, and quite isolating. Um, but equally, it's the best way of of kind of building an ex a thick exoskeleton of, 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 of actually being quite... Um, resistant to to it anything much anymore I, I i don't want to manage difficult artists anymore i think if if they come along i'll listen to their music and go to their concerts but i won't want to get involved <laughs> i think uh, towards the end of the 90s i had a reputation for being able to manage difficult artists to the extent that i nearly managed morrissey um which i actually to be honest i was never going to manage morrissey mm. um i just uh, i thought it'd be very interesting to to meet him uh, i went to see him play at the forum and went backstage afterwards, knowing full well that he would have probably left. But what really does amuse me is that his band had heard a rumour that I was going to be the new manager. So in the nicest possible way, they surrounded me demanding a pay rise. Which <laughs> 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 was a little bit uh, presumptuous. Um, That's your initiation. Rhythm, that was my initiation. And then it kind of went from bad to worse because Morrissey summoned me to a meeting at the Dorchester Hotel one Saturday afternoon. And I thought I had the ultimate excuse which was that it clashed with my father's funeral. And when I wrote to him to tell him any other time, but then I never heard from him again. Really? <laughs> That's a pretty good excuse. <laughs> You'd think so. Uh, but anyway, I, as I say, I, I didn't want to mention him, so. Yeah, wow. I mean, uh, you've got to be pretty diplomatic, I imagine. You've got to be, um, you've got to have a level head. I mean, if they're all taking uh, drugs and getting wasted and hammered, you've got to be the one that's compass mentis as much as possible, I suppose, as the manager, haven't you? Well, yes. I mean, I think it's it's kind of tricky. So on the one hand, you've got to sort of be on their level. Um, and so, you know, after gigs, staying up late, having a few beers, um, is the done thing. And yet they necessarily, if you, especially if you're on a tour bus, they might not need to be up until 4 o'clock the following afternoon. And yet usually I would have to be up at least by 10 a.m. to to get the, start the phone calls and... and pick up the the admin so mm -hmm. it was yeah i think um the, the 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 relationship between the manager and an artist is is it varies from artist to artist enormously um i think one of the things that um i naively as somebody who was lucky enough for their first artist to become successful you sort of think oh it's management luck it's nowhere near as hard as everyone else says it is and then you realize yeah. that that's complete nonsense because you have to uh, have a completely different plan personality to personality um, and uh, as I'm discovering with my lecturing hat on a lot of what one needs to teach is psychology mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with complicated people yeah <clears throat> good well yeah interesting you talk about uh, your educational side you, you have done quite a lot of lecturing and and tutor work um, during your career particularly with BIM uh, yeah I was telling um, somebody this morning, actually, the slightly embarrassing story that it is that about 15 years ago, I said to myself, Phil, if you ever end up teaching at BIM, it means you failed. <laughs> it's a slightly embarrassing thing to admit. Um, at least you didn't say shoot me if you see me in 20 <laughs> years time. No. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that, that um, most of us know now that between about the year 2000 and the year about 2012, 2013, it was a particularly tough time for the music industry, thanks to, in many ways, the invention of Napster, the fact that music became free, everything started to get smaller, um, people weren't signing artists, uh, people weren't buying records, it was very difficult. <clears throat> and um, although I had um, a lot of success with Aqualong and a little bit of success with Duke Special, if I'm really honest, by the time it got to about 2011, 2012, I was struggling to make a living. Uh, and to pay my long-suffering assistant of 20 years, Fran. Um, because 20% of nothing is nothing, and you might have an OK year, but if you're not selling anything, you're not paying yourself. And uh, although my overheads were always very 
minimal, or most usually very minimal, um, I, I started to get worried that, that I might have to sell my house and get a proper job and everything else. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting my good esteemed friend Charlie, aforementioned before Dan, and saying to him, what, what should I do? And his advice actually ended up being the complete polar opposite of what I did. Although it was very sensible, he said, look, you know everybody in the industry. Go and talk to all the bosses of the majors and say you, you want somebody new to manage who's going to make you some money. And what Charlie was really saying was stop being so... Um, he didn't put it in these words, but I knew what he meant. Stop being so choosy about the, the muso acts that you like that aren't always going to be very mainstream, that aren't always going to make you some money, and go and manage something that's going to be commercial and and and... and keep your head above water yeah but maybe I push you as a manager as well but, but maybe yeah. that but but, but I, I think I realized that that management is such a personal business it's a, you know everyone says it's a cliche it's like a marriage that I don't think I'd have done a good job if I didn't like the people and the music and so I rejected that line of, of sort of rescue and instead I, I decided that I'd try my hand at, at lecturing um, and for a little while, I actually did that at Bucks in High Wycombe, um, which is a nasty old commute from Brighton, believe you me. Uh, and then um, BIM had been going for a while, but part of the reason why I'd made that comment about BIM was that it started out as purely for musicians, as sort of a, a glorified rock school. Mm-hmm. And then it sort of wanted to... Um, become more academic and and more recognized and became a Sussex University affiliated institution and had a music business degree and all that side of things which I kind of came along to um, be one of the people who sort of fronted that side of things and so I very quickly became their music business head of department and kind of realized that that I was quite good at lecturing um, partly because I think I'm a good communicator and partly because I keep up to date because I'm very curious and partly because one of the best things about being a manager is you get to see each bit of the music industry where a lot of people will only get to see their own sort of slither of it. Yeah, um, that's true. So um, for the first couple of years I was sort of um, mainly just lecturing and then I think um, been realised that I was probably the most industry connected person or one of them that they had and um, I sort of persuaded them to give me this pretentious sounding post of music industry ambassador where I said to them I would do my best to make as many of the things that they were doing as uh, as industry connected as possible and a lot of my thinking right now is, is about that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I remember hearing someone who I know who went to BIM say that part of the course you'd go to Concord 2 and, and play on the stage as part of what you were doing and I remember thinking that is such a brilliant idea to be practicing there and not just sort of in some study room with your music teacher watching you it's such that's such a genius idea um, yeah and I guess also uh, uh, I, what I've read about you, you you talk a lot about networking getting people to talk together and, and learning how to network as well mm. in the in the industry yeah, I think that's the thing, is that, that actually being able to um, get on with people, communicate with people, um, is such a big part of, of the music industry uh, that on, on, the non, well, on the playing and the non-playing side, it, it's something that, that um, I realised that I was sort of building a fairly um, substantial database and because I hopefully wasn't an arsehole, didn't take the piss, that, that people generally returned my calls. I think you, there, there is the cliche that when you're on the up, everybody will, and, and when things start to go wrong, you know who your friends are because everyone else moves on to the next person that they think is going to be. And there will always be an element of that. Um, but I, yeah, I think that um, I started to to really look at what makes the music industry tick. How does it fit together? And I didn't really feel, I still don't feel, that a lot of people really look at it like that. And especially outside of London, um, building sort of this this new concept of the music city that people talk about, but also musical food chains, I've started to sort of map areas to show show how the different bits of the music industry fit together. And it's my view that you've sort of got four quarters without going into too much detail. You've got the live side, you've got what I call music creation, which is the stuff that begins in the rehearsal room and then ends up getting released in whatever way it does and, and marketed. 
you've got music education and then you've got tourism and heritage and the idea that in every area you can actually find out who works in that industry where are the gaps that either entrepreneurs or people from elsewhere can fill those gaps um, we started out mapping Brighton and there is a, now a website called brightonmusicoffice.co.uk which is uh, owned and run by Chelsea Rickson who was an ex-student of mine um, I'm currently mapping the whole of the Northern Irish music industry for Help Musicians UK, the charity that uh, used to be called Musicians Benevolent Fund and it's one of my biggest ambitions is that each of the areas of the UK outside of London ends up having a, a regional music office with a staff, at least a one person, but also a democratically elected board who tell the staff what to do that's going to actually help the local industry both economically and creatively because I feel that, 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 that doing those things would, would make a huge difference to the ability to, to, to live and work in the music industry outside of London. Definitely, and um, it's such it's an incredible idea to, to, to build up that supporting network within a within a place because um, it does feel like the music industry is a little bit wayward at the moment and and people I guess artists some of them maybe feel really isolated or even scenes are quite isolated so to have some framework behind mm. them to be able to give them funding or give them a platform or give them exposure is an is a really really commendable uh, idea and um is is that what's called Brighton Music City Project? Is that, that it kind of, yes, I mean it kind of is. The, the the Music City's thing. It's 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 a bit of a a complicated thing to to um, really explain because a lot of people assume that that in the same way as as somebody becomes a, a knight, that a city can become a music city, and I think mm -hmm. that that's complete nonsense. Although Hastings, for example, did decide it was a music city a couple of years ago. Um, but but the house it's not a city and it hasn't got any grassroots music venue so <laughs> how it's doing it so every as far as I'm concerned every town every city has its musical side some are better at it than others um, but but a report was written um, that came out of Canada called the mastering of the music city which is available online if you Google the words the mastering of a music city and it's actually a really interesting and well written report which is sort of was sort of in some ways. Uh, those people who became interested in this world was their way in and I got seven of my students to start mapping Brighton to use the um, the advice from this report to see how well or badly Brighton was doing and out of that there's an, a, a London based organisation called Sound Diplomacy who do a lot of work in this this world not quite the same as the work that I do but um, it's it's very much I, th I think you really you'll probably could do a degree on music cities if you wanted to Because, yeah, a lot of people talk about the hierarchy of music sort of changed a lot nowadays because you used to have, if you were, say, making records, maybe may more from a production point of view, maybe more from an electronic side, but you, you'd have to go to the record shop and give them a tape and you'd have the scary moment of them playing it over the, the speakers and them either telling you it was a load of rubbish or telling you it was just about OK. <laughs> you know, so you had, like, these gatekeepers that were, like, were like it was like the hierarchy was a, bit, a little bit different a few years ago well that's that's true and in fact we were talking about this last night and i think that there are two points that are worth making there one of them is i think um whether those gatekeepers were a and r people or indeed radio producers who decided got what got played on the radio that there are times when we've all got frustrated by whether they have the the ears or the talent or the wherewithal of being a, a being allowed to be such gatekeepers why do we need such gatekeepers mm -hmm. having said that it's my view that in in the, the the current streaming climate and i'm a big fan of of streaming and i believe that the likes of spotify have rescued the music industry so all the musicians who bang on about how they don't think they get paid enough i think are wrong um, but that's another subject um in the world of streaming the gatekeepers have a much smaller part to play when radio ruled if you heard a song on the radio and you didn't like it but eventually, by the tenth time you heard it, somehow 
you'd worked out that it was actually you just hadn't got it the first time and it just took 10 listens to really get it yeah there's a lot of music lot. like that and i think that the problem with streaming is that you don't have a gatekeeper and if 30 seconds into the song you don't get it you don't give it another try and therefore the the complexity of music currently is in my opinion um decreasing to the extent that that's only quite simple music is is um is succeeding at the moment or, or largely um, thanks to the new role of gatekeepers. But equally, I think there's another way of looking at it. If you imagine drawing a square with four corners and put it put the following in each of the corners, in one corner you've got the audience, in one corner you've got the artists and the writers, in one corner you've got the rights holders, the record companies and the publishers who actually, if you like, invest in the talent. And in the final quarter, you've got the, the DSPs, the digital service providers, the technology companies. These four corners, people, each have power and each have um, the ability to sway the, their importance um, depending on the, the era. So during the Napster era, when music became free, the audience became kind of largely they were wielding the power in terms of what they wanted to listen to or didn't want to listen to. And then the, the, the likes of iTunes and Spotify came along and sort of wielded the power to a degree. And so at different eras, at different times, each of the, the four corners of the square have their, their sort of stock has risen and dropped. And um, it's fascinating to watch how, how those things ebb and flow. They're all important to each other. They all have a good side and a bad side. Um, none of them deserve to have the full power. Mm -hmm. Some of them are getting paid or, or paying more or less than they should be. Um, but at the moment, I'm an optimist in terms of the future of the music industry. <clears throat> you know, I'm not saying that, 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 that everyone's life is, is rosy in, in the current climate. I think that there's a particular problem where the top 1% of artists, a bit like in a lot of the rest of life, are getting richer and richer. Um, to the detriment of everybody else mm. and that's hugely frustrating and, and not how I would like life to be because in no way are they the best 1% um, but Have there's all sorts of positive things yeah I mean what one thing like uh, what Imogen Heap is working mm -hmm. on have you, have you heard of Mycelia? yeah I have I, I teach a lot about or try to teach a lot about blockchain technology and how the blockchain may impact the music industry it's very complicated uh, the the experts in the field will disagree with each other, um, <clears throat> but it's really exciting that people like Imogen Heap are uh, experimenting in, in these areas. Yeah, because I think uh, blockchain and you know things like uh, cryptocurrency are very new things that people either really get deep into or they're a bit on the periphery and a bit scared of it. And to me, I'm not really sure how it works. But her the ethos behind what she's doing, I mean, it does sound like it's going to empower empower artists um did right oh here we go so what they're trying to do is have a sustainable and vibrant music industry ecosystem uh where all involved are paid and acknowledged fully and with commercial ethical and technical standards set which seems like quite a good blueprint for... Well, of course it is, but I mean, I think if you asked every single artist or probably every single person working in music business in the world whether that's what they wanted, they'd all say, yep. <laughs> um, and equally, <clears throat> the fact that nobody has yet, even though my city has been around for three or four years, um, copied it or, or improved upon it, means that, that some of the challenges of, of the way that she's working, I think, haven't yet been... Um, uh, um, fully realised. I think that, that with blockchain, I mean, the idea of... Um, it being transparent, who owns what and therefore who should be paid, there's something that people talk about called a global repertoire database. What that means is that for every piece of music, there should be a place where anyone could go to go, when we want to pay the publisher, who owns which bits of the publishing, because it often can be lots of people, and the same thing with the recording. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds bloody obvious, but it doesn't exist People have tried to make it exist and, and failed. It's true to say that even with an artist as um, ubiquitous as the Beatles, that actually nobody quite knows who owns what when it comes to the Beatles. Now, if that's the problem for the Beatles, it, it's just a complete and utter mess. And it shouldn't be. And 
until somebody, whether it's Google or, or you know, when they decided that they were going to digitise every book, uh, or, or Cobalt or another f far reaching person, or blockchain, then, then we need those sorts of solutions. So there are still severe problems within the music industry in terms of making sure that everyone who deserves to get paid gets paid and gets paid the right amount. Um, I think that there are far less crooks and charlatans than there were around in the 70s and 80s. So I think that, that's, that the, the concept of being ripped off in the classical sense of the word doesn't happen as much. I think what rip, being ripped off means might have changed a little bit. Um, but um, I think that with uh, the fact that if you're doing a contract with somebody, a record contract, a publishing contract, whatever, uh, that it's not really um, going to stand up in the court of law unless you have a music business lawyer offering you advice, um, means that, that, um, that, that things are more likely to be above board than they used to be. Hmm. Yeah, it um, certainly feels like the, the right way with sort of streaming music. It sort of feels like that sort of technology can, can really be harnessed to give a bit more to the people uh, who are creating it. I know that Beatport are going to have their entire catalogue streamable uh, next year. So if you're a DJ, actually now then you wouldn't need the USB memory stick with all your tracks on it. You're just streaming it <laughs> live okay. from their... Right, yeah, from yeah. Their, um, Site. Uh, from their platform, yeah, yeah, um, which is also cool because they get like instant data of of what's happening where, and yeah, when yeah, and why and who's Absolutely. playing. Absolutely, and that's that in itself, I think, is is sort of democratic in a way. Yeah, um, and also, I guess, going to a little bit, going into the Great Escape, then mm. which you um, co-founded, mm -hmm. um, it's. An incredible festival uh, happens in Brighton in April. May. In May, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think basically uh, it came about through conversations between Martin Elborn, who is the booker of Glastonbury, and a guy called John McEldowie, who's I think now still the booker of Reading and Leeds, or he might have recently left, and myself. Although, um, really shortly after we put it together, I was sort of sidelined, although I'm back involved again now. Um, the idea really in some ways was, was wanting to do the European version of South by Southwest from Austin, Texas. There used to be something called In the City in Manchester for a little while, it was pretty good. Um, and there are all sorts of things, Eurosonic in Holland, Mida in France, um, Sound City in Liverpool. But I think it's true to say that, that, that the Great Escape has grown to become, uh, to be acknowledged to be the biggest and best city-based music festival um, in Europe. And I think it's succeeded in doing that partly thanks to Brighton being a the perfect town city to do it in, partly because the organisers and I'm not this isn't me this is other people who have been quite smart in understanding what they call export ready music in terms of what it is they want to feature when things are ready to break out of of where they've become successful. Mm. It has a great conference strand which is what I'm now part of, um, and. Um, um, it's it's really popular. I mean, it doesn't always work. And when you've got a wristband and you can't get into the things you want to go to, that's frustrating. But that's the nature of these things. Um, but it has been a, a hugely successful thing. In, in many ways, uh, the Great Escape and, and BIM are, are two of the big things that have put Brighton on the musical map in the way that 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 it's become sort of musically ubiquitous. Mm. And you've been heavily involved in both of them. I, I, I suppose so. Yeah, I, I, I am the sort of the sort of person who, who gets involved in things, um, and it's, it's almost a sort of a cliche that when something is is trying to make something happen, it's like let's get Phil involved. Whether it's this new music venue that we're trying to get started in Eastbourne, whether it's a new radio station that's starting to happen, whatever it might be, I think because I have passion, I'm quite clear thinking. I know people. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a networking thing, um, me, and, and I will probably give up my time for nothing. <laughs> no, I'm cheap. Um, when you know, I think when you know it's worthwhile investing yeah, okay, time, absolutely. then absolutely, yes, that's that's, that's probably true. key to it. You probably, yeah, the, you probably get that instinctively quite well from people. Yeah, so Great Escape has about 500 artists playing. Yeah, I, I can sometimes think that I. Um, the whole thing of, of getting discovered 
as a musician is something that I, I, I find very problematic. To me, it's it's sort of um, the equivalent of the X Factor or whatever else that thing of if somebody's going to come along and wave a magic wand and make everything brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, whoever that somebody is, whether it's Simon Cowell, whether it's a manager, whether it's a label, and I think that, that sometimes my problem with with um, music conferences, music events of this sort, is that that people want to go and play South by Southwest or the Great because they think they're going to get discovered, and that's not how generally things work. Um, South by Southwest particularly annoys me in some ways because one of my experiences was managing a band called the Fallout Trust who were on EMI and we went and did South by Southwest because we needed to get a publisher and a booking agent and we played in Austin, Texas in front of 30 people who had all flown from London <laughs> and we got a publisher and a booking agent but why everyone had to actually I mean the ecological footprint is, 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 is ridiculous in itself you know we all probably lived within 30 minutes of each other and we'd mm-hmm. all travelled halfway around the world to play in front of each other that is the, the, what's wrong with these sorts of showcase events um, I will often say to people you have to be very sure you know why you want to do them and equally there's always going to be you know when you've got 500 people playing 100 of them are likely to play in front of nobody and that's quite sad. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think it's like, uh, just before we started rolling, you were talking about um, using logic in the music industry. <laughs> and I think there's a good example of, of that that logic. Uh, going out the window. Yeah, going out the window. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's certainly one of the things I try to impress upon on people saying, when, you, when you're doing something, ask yourself why you're doing it. What does it, what is success going to look like? What is it that you want to get out of it? Um, and yeah, as, as I was saying, the two the first two commandments are don't confuse logic with the music industry because it's not logical and don't confuse justice with the music industry because it's not fair. Um, so you, you really have to, to to know why you're doing what you're doing. Now, you might be doing it purely for fun and that's almost the best reason for doing something uh, of all. And, mm-hmm. and if if it's definitely fun then trying to get an agent, trying to make money, trying to improve any of the other reasons you might be doing something for it can be secondary. Uh, but I think that we can all get lost in, in doing things because we think that's what you're supposed to do. I had a very sobering moment earlier this year when I look back on my 30 years of artist management and the fact that, that you, you're always on, you're living and breathing it. And I, I came to the conclusion that 70% of the hours and hours and hours I'd put in were probably an entirely wasted time. <laughs> but equally, I realised that, that I didn't know which 70% they were. So what you can't do is just say, right, stop doing that 70%, do the other 30%, and look at that time you'll free up. That you can be doing something better with. You can't do that because you don't know which 70% is going to be the waste of time or not. May, there might well be 10% actually that you could probably shave off if you're really self-disciplined. But um, that makes management a difficult thing because you have to be really you have to accept rejection and indeed being ignored Mm -hmm. and 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 be able to not take that personally or not become an incredibly kind of disgruntled unhappy person Um, you have to just get on with it Do you think as a as a manager, I know you said about being in between the band and the label, do you do you feel a pressure to be successful or commer- whatever you deem to be success? Um, is there a temptation to lead the band to be more commercial? Well, um, that's a really good question. I think there's a couple of things that, that you need to, to, to sort of th- think about to answer it. The first one is there's a big difference between music and football in as much as in football the manager picks the side in music the band picks the manager in some ways the band is the boss it's hiring the manager now that doesn't mean that as a manager you do what you're told necessarily although you do a bit otherwise you'll just get fired Um, it doesn't mean you're just an administrator otherwise you should become an administrator and charge a daily rate but it does mean that you have to get under the skin of, of the artist or band, work out what it is that makes them tick. Um, and equally, explain to them that you feel that your job is to both manage and improve upon and succeed in their creative and economic goals. In many instances, the two will clash. 
the band will want to release some 15 minute weird jam mm-hmm. and still want to be rich and they will reject the 2 minute 45 edit remixed by somebody who's currently flavour of the month mm-hmm. so there's a huge amount of um, uh, uh, sometimes compromise sometimes negotiation um, in order to explain to the band that sometimes what they think works doesn't work and I think that the bottom line is that, that every sort of once or twice a year you should have a joker to play where you basically say to the band once or twice a year I'm going to force you to do something against your will um, because in order to make that happen the things you really want might happen but without doing this thing they won't happen it's really tough and <laughs> it, it's it can lead to um, the relationship souring and one of the toughest things about being a manager is that whereas the record and publishing contracts that the artists sign are unbreakable a management agreement is completely breakable um, because a, a, a judge will never make a band be managed by a manager that they don't want to manage them so you are, you are in a remarkably vulnerable position in lots of ways um, and again that's something that some people can cope with and something that other people really can't um, <clears throat> so you learn how to well, I think you learn in your trial period with your artist whether you're going to see eye to eye whether they're going to trust you to be representing them to the industry at large whether you, you know, and, and, and that, that bond either strengthens or it's never going to work mm-hmm. I really like that idea of having a, a joker, a joker card. <laughs> like, I think that's that's an awesome one because it's it's like it makes it more fun. It makes it less predictable. And um, well, it's not usually fun at the time when you're trying to get the band to play it. I mean, just to give you an example, um, over the last um, eight years or so, Matt Hales, Grammy Award-winning artist, um, gold record in the UK, big single in America. Um, he got fed up with touring because he had two children, he didn't like being away from home, and it was that the touring lifestyle wasn't for him. So he became um, much more a producer and a writer for other artists than an artist in his own right. But he wanted to keep his hand in as an artist and do some stuff, just not as much. And we used to joke at some points that, that my job was to stop him from being too successful. Which is, yeah, ridiculous. Hold him back from... Uh, yeah, hold him back from having to go away from home all the time. Because, you know, once you start to get, you get in that treadmill, you know, I, I could probably... He, I think what he was scared of is that I could persuade him of the logic of going off on a 12-week tour, which he was worried would wreck his marriage or just make him very unhappy or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I, I had this sort of tightrope to walk where it was like, keep Aquilon going, but make sure Aquilon's not too successful. And one of his... Um, biggest markets was Japan and <clears throat> this one year when I think he did only three other live shows in the whole year um, we got offered a fairly prestigious slot at Fuji Rock in Japan which is one of the big festivals there mm. and I'd been sort of really kind of angling for it and I got it and I said to Matt this is great and he said can't do it because it clashes with my family holiday to Dominica and um, I decided to play my joker and I felt a little bit scared. I just said, Matt, this is a show you've got to do. I'm afraid. I'm telling you, I really want, and I will help you do it. And if it's a case of you literally fly from Dominica to Japan, do the show, fly back from Japan to Dominica, and continue your holiday, um, I'm really, really, really going to make you do this thing. And he was unhappy, and the relationship was a bit strained. But to cut into the chase, he did the show. It was massively successful. He really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Thank God. <laughs> I don't know what would have happened if it had been a complete disaster. And life moved on. Um, you can't do those things very often because if you do those things too often, then you're not being a manager anymore. You, you, you know, it's it's a it's a car crash. Yeah, and I think you've probably got more sway with the experience that you've got to to say, look, I know this is going to be good for you. Whereas I guess in the early days with yeah. the levelers, you probably weren't able to go, let's do this crazy gig in Northern Scotland on an island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think that's probably true, that, that, um, that, that age and wisdom have a, play a little bit of part. Yeah. Good. Um, so how about um, just in terms of your, uh, in, in being a manager, what, what would you say is the most gratifying part of doing that stuff? Oh gosh. Um, 
Well, it's funny. At, at the moment, on my I, I'm old-fashioned enough to still have a mini iPod thing, and I've got all of the songs by all the artists I've ever managed at the moment as my sort of playlist um, on that. And that's to say, I was listening to this girl Victoria in the gym this morning, and and revisiting all the artists to see which ones have stood the test of time. And the couple, maybe they haven't, or less so. Uh, being involved with music that I passionately adore is is the first and foremost the thing. And it's if you like often because my taste is is a little bit esoteric it doesn't do as well as i think it should or would it's thrilling to me for example that we're sitting here today when sweet billy pilgrim who you might describe as a prog pop band um and, and a genre that nobody wants uh were album of the week in the mail on sunday yesterday in the big half page feature which i was thrilled That's about. fantastic and so it's lovely when those things happen so you know it's those those things where other people recognize the music that you champion um, it's obviously a big deal. Obviously, standing at the sound desk and watching the Levelers headline Glastonbury is a spine tingling moment. Um, mm. It's yeah, I mean, it's that thing of of climbing ladders, but it's not always the biggest moments. Um, but but it's often, in fact, many it's often those first moments. So many massive artists, and okay, I've never really had a massive artist talk about the fact that the type of bit they enjoyed was probably the sort of the, the the middle point of their first record when they're touring their first record and they're starting to headline places like Shepherd's Wish Empire in Brixton and that, that sadly once it gets much bigger than that it stops being as fun. I'm sure that when they get off the road and uh, in their third house in Miami Beach or whatever it is that, that, that they're enjoying the spoils of their whatever but um, yeah, but it is sad how many people that are uh, on paper hugely successful are ridiculously unhappy, um, and so I think again that's that's why managing expectations, your own, those around you, is 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 such a crucial thing because a big and successful isn't always best or happiest, and b every time you reach it, there's another stage ahead of it. Definitely, yeah, definitely. I read Darren Brown's book, uh, Happy, which which talks about success, uh, a lot about stoicism, but also about success. And he says, quite rightly, that you don't get success, it's given to you. You can't choose, I'm going to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's always people that make you successful. Like, and, and yeah, you're right, when you get to, whenever anyone, like a businessman or somebody gets to be a success in a successful position they get there and they then don't see themselves as successful because they have access to the next level um yeah it's a really good book i, I absolutely mm, love that mm, one mm. good and how about for you um a place away from music uh, <laughs> somewhere where you find like serenity that's like nothing to do with music or music industry i am an obsessive walker um, to, but, but what I do is I take myself off on long walks but they can never be the same walk twice so I, the joke is that I'm running out of the south of England <laughs> I've just come back from Dorset where I did two walks in the west of Dorset so I've done all of the Isle of Wight I think I've walked every footpath of east and west Sussex and I find other people talk about mindfulness I don't really understand but, but my thing is, is on the second hour of, of what can be an eight hour walk I get to sort of a place which replenishes me and recharges me and Sometimes I get all my best ideas from in terms of strategic thinking, so I'm not necessarily switched off. I don't think I know how to switch off. I, I actually, sadly, in many ways, don't really know what relaxation is, mm -hmm. apart from using alcohol, which isn't very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think that's my main answer. I, I I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not chock full of, of, of hobbies outside of music, although I like cricket, um, and. Um, and I think that because I'm sort of lucky enough to still be curious at an age when a lot of people sort of lose their curiosity, <clears throat> that, that um, I consider bits of my working life to, to feel a bit like hobbies and other bits to feel a bit like work. Um, mm. So um, when they do, without getting too um, metaphysical, when people on their deathbed say things like um, uh, nobody said I wish I'd worked harder uh, um, I almost say equally I don't feel like um, I have to I have to go off and do something else because that's what people do <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well um, it's been really great to talk to you thank you so much for sharing 
uh, everything you've done. And um, what, what's next? What, what's coming up for you in the future? What sort of things are you working on? Are you excited about? Um, Matt Ackwell has made a brilliant record with a chap called David Rossi, who was in Goldfrap and is currently Coldplay's string player. They've made a record together under the name Soren Lawrenson, which is the imaginary friend's name in the Charlie and Lola books by current children's laureate Lauren Child. Um, mm. And it's a really amazing record, and although it's taking us a long time to set it up properly, I'm really excited that that, that, that does well. So that's a big deal to me on the, that side of things. Um, I'm really thrilled to see how this mapping exercise of Northern Ireland works out, because it has the, the potential to, to be a blueprint for anywhere else in the world if we do it properly. Um, if we, you know, Brighton was sort of nearly properly, it was sort of the template and the, and the starting point and um, um, it feels like it's one of those things which, which if we see it through could make huge differences to, to how um, people who live and work in music outside of the capital city, <clears throat> how they're able to, to get the maximum out of what they do. Brilliant, yeah, and I, th I think it's an amazing way to look at it, um, and t to to provide that supporting structure, that network for for anywhere, um, it's a brilliant thing. So yeah, I wish you all the best with that stuff, Thank you. and um, yeah, with your management and the Great Escape too. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Oh, it was so good to talk to Phil. Uh, he was such a great guy, and uh, he gave some really insightful and thoughtful answers to my questions. Uh, really couldn't have asked for more. He's still got the passion, he's still got the love, he still cares about the music industry and its, its development and its health, uh, which is really important, and I hope for him one day he does become a millionaire. Okay, next month I'm speaking to a producer, a DJ and a prolific releaser of records. I think he's probably released more records than you and I have had hot dinners put together. It's a great chat, we're talking house, we're talking garage and that'll be on next month's episode which is out in November. Thank you very much for listening. I am Midiera, this is Midiera Meets and I'll see you again soon.